Yeah, I'm very happy. Take Sure. Yeah. Okay, folks, I think we should get started. Uh, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS, and I'm also the co-director of the new U.S. Leadership and Development Initiative uh, here at CSIS, which has been generously funded by Chevron. And we have a very interesting program uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, two, of, what, two, of, two people who I consider some of the world's experts on, on the issue of corporate uh, philanthropy, corporate engagement, corporate social investment, uh, uh, and as it pertains to the developing world, I think we're going to hear about the evolution of how Chevron has thought about um, about development more broadly and what it brings to development and then we're going to hear about the specific case study and get an update on uh, the Niger Delta partnership initiative that Dennis Fleming, Fleming runs. So um, we're very fortunate to have Simon Lowe's here uh, from San Ramon who is a manager at, at Chevron and is long, along with uh, Dennis Fleming who's the project director of NDPI. Uh, I'm going to um, hand the floor over first to Simon and ask him to give some comments context about how Chevron has evolved in its thinking over time, and then what I'm going to do is I'll ask Dennis to go into much greater detail about the NDPI initiative, and then we'll have a, a broad conversation. I think we've got a number of very interesting stakeholders here who will be able to, uh, I think, uh, we'll ha have a lot to, to offer to this discussion. So Simon, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Dan. You used the wrong word, philanthropy, just to I know, I, that's why I added several other words, because knowing that that's not the, that's not the, that's not the word Chevron uses, but various other folks do. Okay. There's a whole uh, group of Chevron people around the table here, so please let me invite everyone from Chevron to chip in, because I think you've actually got uh, an awful lot of people who've been involved in a lot of our partnership developments. Sylvia is in charge of our global issues and policy group, spends a lot of time here. Mamadou uh, hides out in bars in the evenings talking about Angola and, and Nigeria. <laughs> and Tam, you all know, and then Dennis um, is running this Nigerian partnership, which I think is almost like a development agency in, inside of Chevron. So you have an awful lot of Chevron people here. It's embarrassing. So please ask any one of us, and, and please everyone contribute. Uh, I've known Dan for a long, long time. I think an awful lot of our partnership evolution and a lot of our partnership thoughts came from work that we did with Dan and, and Holly uh, starting off in Angola eight or nine years ago. So a tremendous amount of our thinking has evolved just from the relationships we've had through, through our partnerships. Um, so Mamadou and, and uh, Tam and uh, Dennis and I sat around last night and tried to figure out what are the best sort of opening comments here to talk about how our partnerships have evolved. So. What I'm about to say, I think, is a summary of, of all of our thinking. Um, up until about maybe eight or nine years ago, I would suggest that partnerships inside Chevron in the development area were primarily philanthropic um, contributions to NGOs that were aligned with our geographies and our, our themes and what we were trying to achieve in our different countries. So we were very active, I think, and strong in working with NGOs and selecting uh, NGOs to help fund uh, and we called it partnership, but in my mind, it really wasn't partnership. It was more just executing policies that our business units were asking us to, to work on or we were trying to project from a corporate standpoint. We would tend to select competent NGO partners. We would fund them and um, we would work with them. But we didn't really get that much involved in, this, in the uh, dynamics and, and the, uh, the work that was involved. We let us turn that over to a partner that did the work. So our early partnerships really were directly funding of, of NGOs. That is, the demands on us grew a lot, and um, I think the stakeholder expectations uh, inside the business units, inside you know, 
the U.S. and, and, and inside the sort of policy leaders and the shareholder activists, and we, we started to see a changing demand for, for what we should be doing in our sort of high-risk business unit. So I think we moved, uh, I would say, to early partnership model. Angola was the first one that we did. Angola was a post-conflict type of situation where we were asked to come in and do some partnership work where we, we started for the first time working with development agencies in multi-development agencies, uh, several of them together, where we were doing nationwide capacity building economic development type of partnership. Uh, and that was a model we hadn't had before. And the dynamics of that for us were, were incredibly interesting. Dennis and I were both involved in that. And we got much more involved in the governance, the uh, the, the management processes, we, we looked for matched funding, and we started to get into thinking we'd never had in the corporation before about working on development outside of our area of operations. We, we actually didn't do anything that helped our particular operations. We spent a lot of time working on capacity building and, and economic development in a very broad sense. That moved us into a realm of partnership we'd never had before. So we sort of went from direct NGO funding to uh, working with development agencies and um, co-managing, uh, helping to where well, we agreed on strategic objectives together, working outside of our areas of operation. So I would call that sort of a post-conflict um, nation building type of, of partnership. Then um, a few years later, we got into a different type of partnership in Nigeria, which was a partnership where we were really trying to bring economic development into conflict area, which was the Niger Delta. And we set up um, a whole series of different partnerships with the communities, which were using the same process that we'd learned in Angola of, of having much better um, participative type of processes with our stakeholders. And again, jointly funding activities rather than just going to the communities and saying, here it is, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We spend a lot more time building the relationships, trying to figure out what the communities might want, and then putting in place a process to allow them to deliver their own uh, programs, and then trying to add some governance and um, sort of leverage to it. So that was a, a model that we used directly with the communities. But again, we learned from Angola that you need these participated processes, I think, to really create ownership and, um, and, and, and a much better, uh, higher impact from, from our investments. Uh, and I think from those three models, one was direct stuff, the other was partnership development through a nation building. The third was a direct partnership to try and deal with conflict that were immediately impacting our communities. We sort of evolved into the model that Dennis is going to talk about, which I would suggest, unless you disagree, has elements of all of those different models inside it. He's working, uh, I should let him do this, he's working with developing his NGOs, he's doing participative processes. But the, the unique thing about Dennis's uh, partnership is that it's providing um, a lot of thought leadership and a lot of guidance uh, for a much broader base of stakeholders. And it's actually almost, um, gotten outside of uh, the company itself and, and is a model where he's developing relationships which we hope will be to the benefit of the whole Niger Delta as opposed to just models that just might particularly help Chevron or the communities around our operations. So it has elements of all of the different models that we have, that we have worked on, all incorporated into one major foundation oriented partnership. As I was thinking about the characteristics of all the different models we've had, the, the word that comes out is participative processes. We have really, and almost every single thing we do in the company now, and every sort of uh, review we do of our social investments, be it corporate or business unit, we're trying to get into participative processes where we, it, it's slower and it takes a lot more commitment to do these participative process partnerships. But the end result is they're much more sustainable. And, and we learn a lot from doing them. So the participation of, of the communities or the development agencies or the NGOs, uh, where we give up control a lot, um, I think we make commitments to themes before we actually agree on what the projects might be within those themes. And, um, and I think we really show a commitment uh, 
almost like we're a development agency approach of our own inside the company. Those participative models are, are really helping us have much more effective, I think, results. The second thing is flexible. We have, we've been really lucky because our business unit managers and our corporate executives, I think, are giving us a lot of flexibility in how we move this investment around, again, both in the business units and um, through the partnerships that we evolve. So we've been able to change, and we've selected partners and worked with partners who have taught us how to change. So instead of these rigid, you know, we give the money to this and we sit back in two or three years' time, I think we've gotten much more involved in the governance of the projects, and that's allowed us to be much more flexible as the dynamics have changed on the ground. The third aspect, I think, of, that cuts across all of our partnerships is leveraging our company's uh, assets. We, in all the ones I've seen and been involved with, we've leveraged something. We either leverage our people, we actually put people into managing the projects, we put them onto committees, we, we get our um, engineers and our geophysicists and our geologists involved in projects and they will ask us why are we doing that and, and it's a wonderful way of getting resources into partnerships. We leverage our people, we leverage our capital projects big time and um, I think we do a much better job of managing the social risks across our capital projects, across the whole life cycle of our projects and in doing that we get our project managers heavily involved and they start to really think about social risks and social issues and then they help us develop and staff up the projects. Uh, and then we leverage our IT uh, in some of the countries where we are, our IT systems are better than the government systems. And I think we leverage everything that we can now in, in our partnerships. And I think the last piece of it is we're much more sophisticated. We're nowhere near where we'd like to be, but we're much more sophisticated in our m and &E systems. And we have pretty good partnership selection matrices, which we go out and, and talk to our business units a lot. So that's just the basic introduction, I think, of, of the evolution of the thinking in our at Chevron. And um, the last, I think, last thing I'd like to leave you with, we sort of have realized that there's no one size that fits all. We, we, we do small partnerships in, some of our really sophisticated but not particularly strategic business units. We do huge partnerships in Nigeria, which clearly is the highest risk area, I think, anywhere in the world where we operate. And, um, and we change, uh, but we learn, I think, with each sort of evolution of, of the new approaches. And what you'd like to hear from Dennis, I would suggest, is by far the most sophisticated thing that we've ever done. And, um, and a lot of uh, different learning sort of have incorporated into, the, into Dennis's approach. Right. So let me just turn it over to Dennis. Dennis, over, over to you. Just if you just push the the black button there. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone, or good day. Um, uh, I'll just start off by giving you kind of a brief overview of what the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative is and what is the concept. And then, uh, as Dan had mentioned, uh, focus a little bit more specifically on uh, some of our strategies for economic growth in the region. Um, on this slide here, you can just see, I tried to, I, I tend to think visually, so uh, um, I tried to kind of use one overall very busy diagram to uh, kind of explain what the, the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative is all about. And what I'd like to, to show from here is that the idea is, as a partnership initiative, that, that we don't want to just use the, the Chevron funding uh, for this initiative to fund projects on our own, but we want to do things in partnership with other donors um, and, of course, with a, a broad range of, uh, of implementing partners. So if you see on the screen, you can see at the, at the funding level, we have the, the Chevron funding, which, which goes into a foundation that we created last year called the NDPI Foundation and this was a model that we had had used um, uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea some years ago that I had a chance to, to work on and I, I found that the, the structure of using a foundation as the funding vehicle for um, an initiative uh, um, was very helpful particularly in terms of broadening, broadening out um, uh, <coughs> the decision-making process making sure that we bring in expertise and, and, and support uh, in a structure that um, provides a lot more um, uh, 
I guess, guidance in terms of accountability and transparency. When you have a separate legal entity, the reporting requirements, the audit requirements, the, uh, um, uh, the way that you structure the governance of a foundation is a useful way of structuring the governance of any type of initiative where you have a lot of project funding decisions. Um, and so we kind of started off with the NDPI Foundation and then discovered also that we would also have to have, by Nigerian law, uh, a foundation incorporated in Nigeria too. So, you know, it was kind of the first step to say, yeah, let's set up a foundation. And then the next step was, okay, well, let's set up another foundation uh, in Nigeria. And, and both foundations have our, our independent entities, they're non nonprofit foundations. And we started kind of a new um, approach for, for Chevron, or is one that we had a chance to, to explore with a little bit in, in Papua New Guinea in, in having uh, a board of the foundation which, which has a, a uh, a, a number of independent directors that were brought in to uh, make decisions on projects that have expertise, a, a lot of experience in the types of things that, that we're funding and pr can provide a lot of very important guidance in, in these decisions. And we're fortunate to have two of our directors for the NDPI Foundation here, and Pauline Baker and, and Lori Regelbrucke. Um, and they've been very helpful in that. And it's certainly a part of the model that uh, uh, I, I feel is an important lesson for Chevron. We have basically very strong decisions, a lot of very useful input, some good healthy debate in our in our board meetings, and that's exactly what you want when you're trying to determine how to spend $50 million. Um, <clears throat> The PIN Foundation also has the same thing. We have three Chevron directors or, or trustees in the case of that foundation and four independent trustees based in Nigeria. So the NDPI Foundation focuses more on the street, strategic issues um, and priorities for the foundation. And the PIN Foundation focuses more on the operational issues. Both of them are new foundations set up specifically for this, this initiative. But this independence and autonomy of these foundations gave us quite a lot of flexibility to do what we needed to do to address the issues and challenges in the Niger Delta. And I think that's that's something, an important lesson that, that I would encourage anyone to think about with these types of initiatives is the fact that um, <clears throat> The types of systems and approaches to doing development partnerships are, are unique and, and often it's better to structure them into a new entity rather than trying to kind of fit those systems into a, a company department um, or some sort of uh, uh, an add-on to something which already exists. The, the, the great opportunity that we had with the NDPI Foundation uh, was this flexibility to say, this is what we want to do in the Niger Delta. Let's create a legal structure, a decision-making structure, a governance system which suits exactly what we want to do. It's designed to do that. It's not meant to fit under some broader uh, uh, structure. Um, so Chevron's funding goes through these, these foundations, um, but we also have our donor partners involved. And as you can see on the slide, we have both government partners and we have uh, uh, our donor partners, and, and not just aid agencies such as bilateral and multilateral organizations, but also companies, private foundations. We're, we're trying to cast a fairly wide net in terms of who we're working with. I think essentially for, for two reasons. One, one reason is there's a lot of donor-funded development programming going on in the Niger Delta region, but it's not coordinated. Everyone's doing their own thing. Many times they're, they're working on projects that are working at cross-threads with each other. One project is undermining another because there's just no real coordination. There's no sharing of information or lessons learned. Um, <clears throat> and then an, another key, key reason is when you get different diverse donors into a project, I think you get a much healthier project because you get a diversity of thinking. I mean, for those, those of you that, that have worked with, with different organizations, you know what it's like to work with a big, powerful donor in a particular project. They tend to, you know, have much more influence over all the decisions and don't have to question what they do. And, and you know, we've all worked with, with people that are incredibly open-minded and, and are willing to consider a lot of different approaches in their work, but I'm sure we've all seen, you know, donor representatives that, that don't, that say, 
my way or the highway kind of thing. Um, and so the, the opportunity to partner with other donors um, uh, really gives us a chance to use these these projects and the co-funding that we're doing together in these partnerships as a, as a development forum to get some useful debate as to what's working, what's not working, how can we work together, how can this initiative link up with this other one. And it's clear through the, the early efforts that we're making so far with, with NDPI that actually everyone is really keen on, on having that, that everyone recognizes that they're not working in coordination as much with others and very few organizations have the flexibility and the uh, um, uh, the opportunity to coordinate to to take a step back and and work with others and and take more collaborative uh, approaches and so we, we found a, a niche essentially for our foundations to be in a coordinating role to be sharing information more broadly to be linking up various initiatives and we're getting quite a lot of interest and support from various partners in, in doing that. Um, you can see in the in the blue box there in the in the middle, the, probably the wording may not be clear enough towards the back, but um, you know, we're funding the programs themselves, development and, and peace building programs. Uh, I'll go into the next slide uh, uh, in terms of what types of programs we're doing. Also research and advocacy and capacity building is a very key element in what we do. Uh, the Niger Delta region has a history of conflict. It, uh, a complex place. There's uh, high levels of crime in places, um, and uh, militancy and criminality, and. Um, <clears throat> What that means is a lot of development programming done in the region almost always has to be implemented through small local NGOs and CSOs that are really the only ones that have access to the communities in the conflict prone areas. But the capacity is very limited. So we quickly realized as we looked at our various programs that we had to have a very aggressive capacity building program to build the capacity of those partners since in, in many locations, it's only through those partners that we can really get uh, um, information as to what's what's happening on the ground. And, and even when international partners come in, they also have to work through those same sort of organizations. So as we work with these various partnerships, it allows us to make sure that we look at what is the local content in terms of organizations participating in these projects and how can we make sure that every international partner comes in is building the capacity of the local partners to do more and more of this programming with less and less uh, uh, guidance and, and mentoring from their, their international partners. So what does this mean in terms of, of what we're actually doing? What programs are, are we doing? Um, we started off our, in developing our strategic framework for this initiative in developing, we, we, we looked at, at you know, the, the conflict that we were seeing in the region and we recognize that we needed to take a more systemic approach than, than many of the, the donors have uh, uh, taken, particularly the oil company donors in the region had taken in the past. And we, we wanted to address what was seen through a lot of stakeholder engagement as kind of the root causes of conflict in the region, which is essentially poverty and unemployment, uh, lack, <coughs> excuse me, lack of uh, uh, civil society capacity and government capacity <coughs> in the region. And we, we saw those as key drivers of, uh, um, of conflict that, that we could address as a part of our programming. So we, we, we looked at economic growth, very high expectations for uh, jobs in the region that's driving a lot of conflict. We looked at uh, um, developing a capacity building program to address the uh, um, capacity of uh, local government and, and CSOs. Um, we identified a peace building program that would look at uh, um, uh, promoting peace in the region, and then an analysis and advocacy program, uh, which is kind of cross-cutting and providing the, uh, uh, the analysis that feeds into the program design in the other three program areas. Uh, but when we drafted our first strategic framework, we realized that it's very easy to for those program areas to, to become silos within the foundation, where you know what you're doing in economic development has nothing to do with what you're doing in capacity building or, or peace building. So we kind 
kind of had a rethink early this year to make it more integrated. And you can see in the boxes above those four program areas um, how we're, we're basically integrating those four program areas under the kind of the overall goal of generating impact in terms of income and employment. And it was an interesting evolution in, in my own thinking because I really kind of thought more of economic development um, since we, we saw it as, as a root cause of, of conflict that I, it was like economic development for peace. But now as we kind of restructured it from a programmatic point of view, we see more peace for economic development. It's kind of a, a subtle difference, but it's important in terms of integrating our programs because there's a lot of types of conflict within the Niger Delta region. It's not just militancy. That is one, one type of conflict, but there's actually quite a lot more. Some of it violent, some of it nonviolent. But when we started relating those conflicts that, that relate back to the, the kind of the, the systemic constraints to economic growth, it helped us to target our peace building uh, uh, strategies a little bit more specifically to how they can generate kind of poles of economic growth in areas where you feel like that economic growth is going to uh, be an incentive to reduce violence and, and conflict in a, in a specific area. So. That means that, you know, for all of our program areas now, uh, we, we look at that integration aspect much, much stronger. That it has to identify in a peace building program or a capacity building program how it contributes to economic growth. And uh, um, uh, our, our board members, very rightly so, you know, ask any time that we put a project through for approval, well, how does this relate to the rest of the programs that you're doing? How does it contribute to your overall strategy? And that's really important because it's very easy when you look at a, a, a partnership I initiative to just kind of follow what the various donors are doing. Before you know it, you have kind of an ad hoc portfolio of different projects, which are very hard to get some level of, of integration. Uh, but with this st strategic framework, we are uh, much more focused, and at times it's actually helped us to even get some of our donor partners a little bit more focused on linking and integrating the programs that they want to do with us because in some cases, our, our donor partners, too, are struggling to see how they can get their, their uh, programs to contribute towards a common strategy rather than four separate strategies related to four separate program areas. And if you see at the bottom, then that gives you an indication of some of the pr principles of intervention that, uh, uh, that we're focusing on. Um, government participation and alignment, for example, um, it's a critical element, you know, that, that working with the government and the Niger Delta is challenging. There's a lot of corruption in various places. There's uh, um, uh, there's so much kind of political maneuvering involved in government development decisions. It's it's hard to get them kind of focused on on um, uh, real needs uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, gender and youth mainstreaming. Uh, um, the the uh, women of the of the Niger Delta uh, uh, clearly uh, have extra challenges in terms of participating in the economy there. There's a, a, a lot of uh, 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 traditional gender norms. There's a, a lot of uh, uh, gender issues that, uh, um, uh, that if they're addressed correctly in our programming and our mainstream in our programming can make a big difference um, uh, for that segment of the population. The same thing with youth. Um, uh, youth population of the Niger Delta is about 60%. It uh, uh, represents a huge chunk of the, of the population and when you relate it to those people that are involved in conflict, it represents a much higher percentage of, uh, of those people involved. Um, I won't go through every of these point by point because uh, uh, you can ask uh, uh, questions later, but one I would like to highlight a little bit here is recognizable constituency. You know, that's kind of a, a vague term, but what it, what it meant for us is, is as we look at local partners, for example, to, to work with, um, we, we find, as, as you find in so many areas, but particularly areas where there's, there's funding going in, and a lot of the funding for development programs is actually coming from oil companies in the region, and they haven't tended to be um, uh, so specific in terms of who those organizations are representing. It, it's, it's really that the, a lot of the 
the CSOs in the Niger Delta are contractors. They're, they're, they're doing what the donors say they want to do. They're bidding on those projects. They rarely get the opportunity or the resources to pursue their own strategies, their own vision for development in the, in the region. Um, but there are civil society organizations, more often CBOs, and, and particularly business membership organizations, uh, which have a clearly definable constituency. You deal with the organization, you know who they represent. They have details of their members. You go to many of the, the smaller NGOs, it's not clear who they represent. They may focus on a specific sector or development need, but you don't know, they don't have any kind of a membership base that you can point to. They, they, it's not clear who they actually represent. And so, like in our capacity building programs, for example, that's focusing us much more on market women's associations, farmers associations, various uh, uh, trade associations and business membership groups that have that clearly recognizable constituency. We know who they represent, and many of them are already sustainable without any kind of donor support because the, they're, they're, they exist on the support and the dues of their members. And if their members are continuing to pay their dues, then that's a clear indicator that they have a broad level of, of support because the economy there is not such that people have a lot of money to burn on a trade association that doesn't do anything for them. And civil society organizations such as trade associations, trade unions, actually wield quite a lot of influence and, and power within the, the, the region. Um, and so it's an important check and balance on what the government is, is doing and, and gives us, in terms of our capacity building programs, some specific focus areas in terms of who we can work with uh, in, with organizations that are not going to be just totally dependent upon donor funding to exist after our projects. Um, other basic things I think you're all aware of, participatory approaches, transparency and accountability, the foundation models, we, we have to have audits, we have to you know, release annual reports, we, we have to do a lot of things which are really uh, um, discretionary for corporate funding initiatives in, in situations where it's uh, just a charitable contribution or it's done from, from a department. And that increases the accountability uh, um, and transparency of, of what we do. Um, and another one that I, I want to highlight is poles of growth. You know, the, the Niger Delta region isn't all of Nigeria, but it's still 30 million people. It's, uh, it's still too vast for $50 million to, to really have a region-wide impact. So that means you're going to have to narrow your geographic focus. You're going to have to look even at how do you go about prioritizing that geographic focus. And so our strategy in that essentially is to look at where are the right conditions for creating what we call poles of growth, where you can cluster projects and activities and you can focus on a geographic area that through all four of those program areas is going to have a more balanced um, uh, and aggressive uh, development agenda. And then ideally what you're getting is uh, uh, not just a strong example that helps us to scale up our own existing programs, uh, but it, it also gives us a chance to, to show some models that, that can be replicated by others. It doesn't have to be done by us. We can you know, share our lessons learned, maybe plow some new ground for other organizations, other donors even uh, to do that and we're already getting that kind of interest other oil companies have been paying close attention to what we're doing with these foundations and this initiative and there's a great deal of interest in getting involved and learning from it and learning from it in ways where we can collaborate with them on, on individual projects or set examples that they can they can replicate and say okay well we'll set up a foundation and we'll do, do our own type of thing and we'll collaborate with you where you can and so those kind of ideas are coming out and it's still early days for us, but the, the, um, the interest that we're getting is even much larger than we had expected. We really feel like we've kind of found a niche in terms of what donors and implementers and government are looking for uh, to find ways to, to collaborate. Um, <clears throat> So I've talked a little bit about what we're doing. I'd like to, to mention briefly about some of the, the partnerships that, that we already um, uh, had signed up. 
uh, GIZ was, you know, was basically our first uh, uh, agreement and uh, uh, commitment. They came in with a small amount of funding, but they had a economic development center in another state, which posed as a useful model for us to consider doing in the Niger Delta region, and uh, got into a partnership with us on uh, um, on developing an economic development center uh, uh, in Wari in the Western Niger Delta. Uh, we are collaborating with UNDP on the design of a social action fund for the, the Niger Delta. If any of you uh, are familiar with Angola and familiar with FAJ, the Fundo de Apoio Social, uh, is, uh, is one of the models that uh, UNDP and the EU are looking at for this social action fund in the Niger Delta. And that's intended to be a multi-donor trust fund um, and is kind of under the umbrella of the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs. So that's kind of an exciting project, but it's very early days, and our participation in that is contributing some consultants to the design team for identifying how this, this fund can be set up. Uh, our biggest partnership so far uh, w is with USAID. We signed a, uh, um, an agreement for a total of $50 million of funding, 25 from NDPI and uh, 25 million from USAID into what we're calling an Integrated Peace and Development Alliance. And that's not one project. I'd, I'd, I'd hate to spend $50 million on one project. <laughs> uh, so it's a portfolio of, uh, of, of projects. And we have a number of them identified that are still in their plan stages and will come out over the next, uh, say, one to two and a half years as we kind of work through the priorities of which projects that we're, we're focused on. Um, but to give you an idea of some of the things that we're working on with them now or planning is a civil society small grants program, uh, a local governance program, a uh, very early stages of planning a conflict management program, and, and an agriculture value chain program, which I'll mention a little bit later as I talk more about economic development. Um, and then lastly, we, we haven't developed a formal uh, agreement, partnership agreement with DFID, but they've recently received ministerial approval to get into a partnership with us. And um, mostly focused on economic development and, and a little bit uh, uh, less on, on peace building. Um, but they can't actually, we can't formalize those partnership agreements until we, we work through some of the analysis that, again, I'll be talking about a little bit later. However, DFID have already really started partnering with us in terms of doing the economic research and uh, uh, analyzing the sectors that we want to focus on. And so we're already working very closely with them in terms of our economic development strategy. So, so those are just some of the, the partnerships. We have some other programs that we're, we're developing that uh, uh, include organizations like Rotary International are working with us on an appropriate technology project. Uh, we just uh, recently have had some discussions with the company Schlumberger who are putting in a special technology project under that uh, appropriate technology project. And, and that's uh, um, one that we've, we've structured such that different donors can come in with dedicated technology funds for a specific purpose, but supported and guided by the appropriate technology enabled development that's the name of the program, ATED for short, uh, that program staff to support those. So the donors can come in with the funding and the guidelines and uh, representatives on a grant committee uh, to look at, at how those individual projects are funded. But all the legwork, all the planning, and the support can be done by one common uh, team of, uh, of specialists that uh, uh, look at the, the uh, appropriate technology. Engineers Without Borders is the main uh, uh, implementer in that and is a close partner with us. And it's interesting to note that while the technology, the technical aspects of those programs are important, quite often what we find is the, the, the bigger expertise that's needed is not technical expertise, but the ability to apply the technologies to the development context that they're needed. So quite often it's still actually more social than it is technical. And that's been one of Engineers Without Borders' big challenges is they get a lot of volunteers that want to go out and design a very complicated water supply system, for example. Uh, and they come out and they find that the, the, the technical side of it is the easy part, is how do you structure the water community in the community? How do you, you know, structure that project to be sustainable, that's where the expertise is really needed. And, you know, to their credit, Engineers Without Borders has really developed a lot of expertise in that arena. 
So now this is the my, my little fun slide, um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our strategies as they relate to economic development and and partly why economic development is our our kind of the key priority for this Niger Delta Partnership Initiative. So I'm going to take you through something a little bit conceptual here, but if you think about you know. Poverty, and if you look at you know basically uh, uh, levels of income and the, the size of, of population in the Niger Delta region, and start to kind of break them up into various categories and groupings, whether they be by communities or by you know by gender or age group, and you you you, you can identify different segments of the the population. <laughs> Some of, of which you know have high levels of income, and, and you know the the Gini coefficient in uh, uh, in the Niger Delta looks pretty bad. You know there's a huge disparity between the haves and the have-nots um, in the region, and so what you have is a lot of people, a much you know a higher percentage of the population in these lower income levels, um, and really a poverty barrier. Now I've just, for example, used the, you know, the, the dollar a day kind of definition for poverty. Um, uh, but you know, if you, you look at it in terms of people's attitudes about their economic conditions, it's going to vary in terms of whether they consider themselves to be in poverty or not. And that's an important issue when it relates back to, say, a company like Chevron. We're working with communities that are close to our operations because you know, typically what we find is those communities that are closest to our operations, their definition of poverty is, is much, you know, if they consider themselves to be in, in poverty, compared to say a community in the north of Nigeria they would be pretty well off you know but it's it's all relative they feel like they should be receiving you know a much higher percentage of the benefits of oil production in their midst uh, um, and so you know they might still be making quite a lot more than than their you know their compatriots in the in the north of Nigeria but still feel like they they're you know in dire poverty and uh, um, uh, uh, in need of a assistance to get out of that. Um, but you have this, this, this poverty barrier that's very difficult for people to, to basically cross over that line. And below that line, this is where conflict breeds. You know, with a much higher level of economic growth, you would not see so much level of conflict. It's also where corruption tends to breed. And there are opportunities for people to to cross that line and, and to, to go from the, the bottom side to the to the top side there. Some of them are legal, many of them are not. Uh, some of them are, are associated with growing sectors, uh, uh, maybe even associated with the oil industry itself. Many of them are associated with uh, um, political patronage. Many of them are associated with criminal activities or militant activities. Uh, but you know, basically, you have everyone crowded up against that that barrier, that poverty barrier, trying to to get past it. Um, and so, you have various programs that are funded by donors, whether they be company donors like the international oil companies operating in the region or um, by the aid agencies. And aid agencies haven't tended to do so much in the Niger Delta region, mostly because virtually all of the socioeconomic indicators in Nigeria are worse in the north. And so they look at how much money is floating around the delta and they say if, if, you know, if the oil companies can't make it work, if the government can't make it work with all that money going there, what can we do? We're better off focusing our funds in those communities that, uh, um, that are quite happy to be assisted and don't have that entitlement mentality and, uh, um, uh, and are clearly worse off in, in every respect. And, and that's a, you know, that's certainly a, a, a very defendable position and, and understandable as to why they would focus just on the north. But you know, the problem is that the government of Nigeria relies on oil production in Niger Delta for something like 90% of its revenues. And so the, the, the Niger Delta finances the rest of the country. And so if you have a situation like you had in early 2009 where conflict was, uh, uh, was increasing and uh, oil production was, was more than cut in half, then the whole country was feeling it. And people started to recognize, including the, the donor community, that the Niger Delta is not just a regional issue, it's a national issue. 
And once recognized as a national issue, the, the donor agencies started to, to want to do more. But then you get into the issues, okay, you're spending more money, you're doing more, but are you actually moving the needle? Are you moving anyone from below that line to above that line, since that's kind of the key objective for so many people in the region? And so a lot of the more traditional approaches towards poverty alleviation in, in the region were not really addressing the systemic problems that were keeping people below that poverty barrier. Instead, they were looking at these direct assistance models. You assist one business at a time, and you're limited by how many of those businesses that you can train and support and assist. So, you know, looking back at the diagram, you'd see that nothing is in many programs is really being done to address this barrier. What is stopping people from crossing it? And instead, just going and helping them one business at a time to bring them across that barrier, to carry them across that barrier without really addressing the systemic causes of that barrier in the first place. And what that means is to, to assist businesses to promote entrepreneurship and development in that way, so you're very limited to how much you can do for each individual business. Now, for those of you that are familiar with M4P or the Making Markets Work for the Poor approach, you recognize that if you, if you look more systemically at these challenges of, of crossing that barrier, that instead of assisting those one businesses at a time, and I, I didn't put this into the animation of the slide, but the reality is that those little dots that I, I, I moved up, often as soon as the funding stops, move back down. Or it, it's, it's rare for, for you know, donors or implementers to even recognize when they're moving one person across that line, is there someone else somewhere who's just moving right back down? And all they're doing is, is you know, basically assisting one business at the expense of another. So looking at M4P approaches to uh, economic development and taking a value chain approach that looks much more at these systemic constraints that erect that poverty barrier, we, we started to recognize that you can actually, actually have a much more significant impact by trying to remove some of those systemic constraints, taking the, the roadblocks out of the way for people to be able to cross that poverty barrier. And then instead of moving one business at a time across, you can move one whole market segment across at a time. And this is where so much of our discussions get into as we're currently doing that economic analysis is, is that you know we can see some potential areas for economic growth. We can see um, some opportunities to, to um, assist businesses. Um, but when we take a systemic look at it, instead of looking at assisting maybe dozens or hundreds of businesses, we expect to assist thousands. And every time that we get, you know, kind of into the nitty gritty of our value chain analysis of the different sectors that we focused on, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute, um, we, uh, um, uh, we keep asking ourselves, how many people rea realistically can we make a difference with with this initiative? Is it going to be just a few people, or is it going to is it going to be hundreds, or is it going to be thousands? And the fact is that there are things you can do to assist thousands, and that's where we're tending to, to focus more effort. So there's a lot of things that can be done, but if you just go in and jump in and say, okay, I'm going to assist this business and that business, that's a lot of what is happening. People are, are saying, let's train a whole bunch of people, give them skills to get jobs. Let's not worry about where they're going to find the jobs. Let's just hope that they get them, you know, and we'll do the training side. Or let's go and train businessmen to, you know, to improve their businesses and do a BDS program that's going to assist them. But, you know, if you're not looking at what are the systemic problems they're facing, you can be investing a lot of money in one thing that's not going to change because you haven't removed that constraint. You haven't, you know, basically taken out a few bricks of that wall for them to go through. So, in terms of the, how we go about doing that, um, uh, our process now for, for approaching economic development is we started off by identifying a, a, a range of um, economic sectors uh, for potential support um, and looked at those with high growth potential, but uh, not just you know, income and employment growth opportunities, but also those that have a potential for broad impact on the poor. Yes, we want to generate economic growth, but we don't want to you know, basically make the rich richer. You can get GDP 
impact you can get, uh, um, you know, uh, raise incomes of businesses. But if it's these these you know people that have strong political connections and a lot of uh, uh, contracts and making them a little bit wealthier, it's not going to address the the social problems of having all those people existing under the poverty barrier in the Niger Delta region. Uh, so. It's, it's not just economic growth, it's equitable economic growth in the region. Um, and then a potential for stimulating systemic change, taking blocks out of that poverty barrier, out of that wall that people face. So we actually went through that analysis earlier this year. We gathered whatever data that we can. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of secondary data available on the Niger Delta region. So if you want data, most often you just have to go out and get it and collect it yourself. Um, but through that and, and through the participation of our donor partners, we gathered a lot of information on, on economic sectors. I think about 30 different sectors we, we got some data on and a lot of general economic data. Sat down with USAID and DFID and World Bank and the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs and just went through all of that. And where is the potential? Uh, uh, where is the, the, the poor population within this economic sector? What is the potential that we can do? You know, and some cases we found sectors that have high potential for economic growth but we couldn't really find anything that we could do to improve that and so it's not just enough to find a high potential growth sector you have to find a sector that a program intervention is actually going to make a difference in uh, so as we identified those, we, we kind of narrowed it down to five sectors for uh, economic analysis, oil palm, cassava, fisheries, building supplies, and clothing textiles. And we then started a value chain analysis of those five sectors. And we're kind of on the tail end of that uh, process now. And we're identifying systemic constraints to growth opportunities for the poor within those five sectors. And so you start very broad and you just keep narrowing it down as you look at your economic data until you can find something that you're realistically going to move the needle, that you're going to take a chunk out of that poverty barrier that I was showing you before. And then you can design your programs and your interventions. And since we're still kind of finishing our value chain analysis of those five sectors, um, we we don't know yet what we're going to do. And we're reluctant to say, this is exactly what we're going to do. And people come up and say, well, you, you, know, you should be doing BDS and you should set up a BDS project. We said, well, we don't know yet whether BDS is actually going to make a difference. You know, all of it needs to be based on analysis. And so it may be one big project that we do with our donor partners. More likely, it will be a collection of projects, um, uh, depending on what the donors can do and who is where and how much of a need there is for synergies or how separated the projects will be. And that's a process we'll be going through over the next few months as we analyze all of this data that we've been, been gathering. Uh, I'll just touch briefly as to what we mean by value chains. I think uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with the, the concept, but you know, taking the systemic approach and, and looking at economic development within an individual economic sector, we need to understand all of the players in the sector. Now, I've been fortunate to do with Chevron a number of different types of, uh, of development uh, initiatives, and quite a lot of them involved in economic growth and, and, and development. And one of the problems that I often saw in the past is this lack of a holistic approach. You get together with a donor partner and you say, we want to do microfinance. And so it's kind of a solution in search of a problem. And you look around for that problem that's going to be solved by microfinance. But so many programs that I've worked in the past don't neatly you know, cluster all of their systemic constraints in the financial arena, you know, or in the business development services arena. Sometimes they're policy oriented, sometimes they're conflict oriented, sometimes they're uh, associated with uh, uh, lack of finance or lack of capacity and training, but often that training or that capacity building is not going to yield any results unless you're combining it with a much broader strategy for how to improve that, that sector. So you can see in the, in the value chain, you look, you know, basically even before production, you look at input supply and you follow channels of uh, distribution, channels of, of economic value added in that whole process until your product reaches the, the consumer. 
and who all is involved in there. And so instead of just like, for example, if we're looking at agriculture programs, instead of just focusing on farmers, you know, if, if our data is telling us that, you know, the, the biggest economic growth opportunities are in downstream processing, they're in distribution, uh, they're in import substitution in, in some way, there's a, a lot of different ways that you can improve that sector that may not involve the agricultural production itself. Or there may be constraints that, yes, you, you can improve yields and improve production, but if you don't improve the, the, the whole distribution network, if you don't improve the processing, the extra yields aren't going to make any difference. And so this is the analysis that we're looking at. We're looking at the end markets. Uh, we're analyzing vertical linkages as well as horizontal uh, linkages, looking at supporting pro products um, and services. Uh, we've seen situations where a value chain analysis uh, from some of our partner organizations has started off on one sector and uh, uh, was I, I think, yeah, is a good example that DAI was, was using in some of the value chain analysis training uh, with our local partners was uh, one where they, they had a, a, a poultry project in, in Mozambique and it was, uh, um, you know, the, the need was to focus on improving the poultry industry. But when they did their value chain analysis, they found that the primary problem was in the production of feed. So what started off as a poultry project very quickly turned into an agriculture Culture project focused on feed production. And it was a part of that same value chain, but it was a value chain that kind of led to another value chain. And so these are the things that we're looking at. We're looking at the enabling environment issues. We're looking at a, at a broad range of systemic constraints. And we're basically at this point going where the analysis is leading us, rather than making a lot of arbitrary decisions about what we should be doing or, or focusing on. So some of the elements of the value chain analysis, looking at the relationships uh, amongst the market participants, uh, uh, value chain mapping, I find extremely useful to, to kind of look at a glance as to who are all the players, what are the components of the value chain, and where are the, the opportunities for growth within it. Uh, market trends and competitiveness, governance structures, constraints and opportunities, all of these are components of that value chain analysis. And a lot of times it's easy to look at a value chain map and to think it looks fairly simple that you can kind of gather a lot of economic statistics and get it. But it, you know, it represents quite a lot of field work, quite a lot of talking to different stakeholders, and it's not all quantitative. You often you have to get a lot of qualitative feedback from different market participants as to what are the challenges that they're facing. Um, and so that's pretty much my, my spiel on, on economic development. I, I'm sure everyone kind of has their own experiences in that regard, but uh, um, we found it a, um, a useful approach to you know, kind of start from a, a general interest in improving economic uh, uh, growth in the region to the specifics of how do we get to those sectors and those uh, uh, elements and market players of the market system that is going to generate the most impact. Uh, also, I should say just in the slide that uh, if you want to more, find out more information about NDPI, you can go to our website at uh, NDP ndpifoundation.org and we, we post our quarterly reports on there, we post our strategic plan that I mentioned is, is on that and information on the various partnerships and programs that we have. D Dennis, that was fantastic. Um, that was probably the most detailed um, analysis I've ever seen a company do. I mean, I can think of AID doing an analysis like that. I can see the bank doing something. I mean, it's really, uh, it's, it's clear to me that Chevron is a significant development actor in a number of countries, including including Nigeria. I'm, I'm curious about two things. One is the evolution of how, particularly in Nigeria, but you can also refer to other countries, the evolution of thinking by other donors and how they work with you. Um, I can think about when Simon came to see AID 10 years ago, I'll be a little bit flippant and not totally fair, but um, and say the following things, that the World Bank said, no, we cut big checks to government, so we can't help you in Angola. Uh, UNDP said, well, Angola's not our favorite country, so no. And then AID said, yeah, 
tests were available to help, and so we were sort of, AID was the only game in town. I think, obviously, there's been some stretch on the part of some of the other donors. GTZ is, I think it was, you know, a small, you know, has a model, and you're, in essence, franchising it. DFID's interested and wants to have a second date, it sounds like, and um, UNDP is, you know, taking something that they stretched on doing with you in Angola and, and taking to, so it sounds like there's been an evolution in thinking. It's obvious that it's still not perfect, and I'm sure there's lots of shortcomings and challenges of working with an organization like AID. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about your view uh, about how that's changed over time and how, obviously, your they see, obviously the analysis is probably driving a lot of the interest in addition to the fact that you bring a lot of resources, but the fact that you're, in essence, providing significant thought leadership, I would also think, is, is, is giving you a different kind of a voice at the table. Well, I, I think that's, um, you know, part of the, the evolution of thinking that we're seeing is, you know, usually when the first time I approach a, a potential donor partner or even an implementing partner in, in some cases, uh, um, you know, particularly if they, they know that Chevron is funding and supporting this initiative, the, the, usually the initial reaction is we don't have a clue as to what we want to do and how we want to go about doing it. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so we have to kind of overcome that perception that, okay, just, just do what we tell you to do and then you'll be fine. And, and of course, every organization has their own drivers, their own objectives. Um, and so I think we've gotten better over time at articulating ours and defining our strategy and, and demonstrating that, yes, we do know what we want to do. And, you know, particularly in, in the Niger Delta, for example, all the donor partners that we're working with they have nowhere near the network of contacts and local partner organizations and data and even access to getting data uh, that we do. And that's what has really kind of positioned us fairly well uh, within the development community in, in the Niger Delta because not a lot of people are investing in research, for example. It's very hard to get any accurate, reliable data on the region. And as we start to go out and invest in gathering it ourselves, of course, we get a lot of interest from organizations that want to use that data. And so we're, as we, we produce reports, we're you know putting them on the, on the web and making sure that we make them available to, to others, um, and also that we do some, some advocacy with some of that information. Um, so if we identify systemic constraints that, that you know, may not be a part of a program, we still can use those value chain studies as an advocacy to, to encourage other organizations, other donors, to address some of the things that, that kind of don't make our final cut in terms of the, the programs that we're doing. So I, I think that, you know, usually the, 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 on the first date, so to speak. Um, they say, guess give us the money and we'll send you a postcard yeah, yeah, in about exactly. a year, right? Uh, and then when we make it clear that we don't, then it kind of starts to open the door to get into real discussions to say, okay, yeah, we can talk like partners. It's not us telling you what, what you should do. Cause, and the reality is with these kind of multi-stakeholder development partnerships is that everyone has something to bring to the table. And if you, you think that your partner is just there, and I, I see this with the uh, local organizations a lot, you know, uh, um, an international organization will come in and they'll bring in the local partner and they'll see it as basically fulfilling a local content policy, but they don't really expect them to contribute anything useful or, or viable. Um, and then they often they miss a really important opportunity to really explore what that local organization has to offer. Uh, and, and so many do have something to offer, and you just need to, to you know, look more carefully as to how to identify that. So I think we've kind of now established ourselves within the development community in Nigeria, and once we get past that first date, then it, it really starts to open the door, and it goes almost to the other extremes, like they want to do everything then. And, and then we've gotten in a situation where when we started the NDPI Foundation, we thought we would really struggle to get the kind of donor matches. Our, our target, our goal was to get a one-to-one -one match of, of um, external donor funding to the $50 million that uh, Chevron is putting into it. And um, we've, we've already identified $30 million um, in funding.
funding, and once the DFID funding is, is finalized, that will go up again to a significant amount. So, and this isn't even, we're not even a year old yet, so it's a... Uh, so it's um, more than dinner and a movie with DFID at this point, it sounds oh yeah, like. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's good to know. We're holding hands. We're, oh, that's great, that's yeah. great. It's good to do okay, We'll keep it at that, we'll keep it at that, right? But just to, yeah, but like I, mean, I was going to ask... We haven't changed our relationship status on Facebook. Oh, you haven't changed our relationship status, that's it, that's it. That, I, well, I was curious, I wanted to ask Simon about this. I mean, Simon, I have an additional comment, but I'd be interested. Uh, this is very, this is quite deep, the level of analysis. This is quite uh, uh, quite involved, obviously. This has taken, a, this is, shows a lot of evolution in thinking, massive investments. How are you transferring this, lessons learned through the system in terms of, where, how are you taking this to P&G? How are you taking this to Angola? Well, there's two things going on there. One is, um, Everything Dennis is doing is extraordinarily, I think, sophisticated and, and externally focused. And as he's been building those partnerships uh, in sort of the enabling environment space, we began to realize that we needed to actually pull back a bit and start developing a lot of internal partnerships to learn from some of the leverage, I guess, that he's been getting with the development agencies. So we actually did an audit inside the business unit of what we called social investment. We used to call it community engagement. We sort of changed the terminology. And we found out that we were reporting 30, 40, 50 million dollars to our executive committee under the, you know, under the, the budget category of social investment. But the real investment was probably closer to 500 million. And um, when we started putting and this, this has to do with localization of your, your this is localization of your procurement and the yeah. right it's not just the, the the grants money it's it's all sorts of other it's, activities it's probably six to seven separate buckets of social risk management activity in different parts of the business unit so we had um, monies we have to give to the Niger Delta Development Commission it's almost a tax on our operations but it's going towards social investment in the Niger Delta we had our own public affairs budgeting process, which was well managed and uh, uh, thematic and sort of focused on the areas of operations. We had the GMOUs I mentioned, which was our partnership investment, uh, you know, specifically around eight regional communities where we saw them as high risk. We had all of our deep water projects where we have to give a certain percentage of our deep water budgets, and this is a new major capital projects, uh, to social investment funds that's managed by the industry. And then the light bulb went off that our local community content group was out spending three or four hundred million dollars developing an economic sort of value chain to support our local community content drivers. You put that whole thing together, you've really got massive amounts of money floating around in this area. I mean, so you, can, you, can, you compare that to AID, which is probably paying 100 million or 150 million dollars a year just in Nigeria as a country, right? I mean, this is multiples of that. So to try and bring some capability across all of that, and I think match the sort of governance model that Dennis is up here, we just set up an internal social performance management council inside the business unit. And we've taken all the business leaders that are involved in all aspects of those different buckets of activity and we just put them together uh, and we're just using it sort of a governance model inside Nigeria to try and bring some uh, alignment amongst all these different uh, activities. And the, the beautiful thing about what Dennis is doing, the whole value chain analysis sophistication that he's got, we're realizing we can bring that same um, process to our internal local community content and have them start focusing more on which sectors they want to develop for uh, to support local community content. And that's um, almost getting to where we're taking the development expertise we've got and helping us with the compliance activity. Nigeria is absolutely unique. We don't have anything like this in another business unit. Um, the closest to where you might be able to start doing some of that is probably in Indonesia. But Nigeria is just a, a step function ahead of every other business unit in the company. So we're learning, you know, we, we, we're working a lot with Dennis. We're trying to, you know, share a lot of his thought processes. But at the moment, we're in a very different level of sophistication, I think, in, in the other business units. Because again, we don't have the conflict business drivers. The business drivers for everything we're doing in Nigeria is very easy to articulate. You can go to your managing director and say, if you do this, you'll get more barrels out of the ground or you'll reduce, you'll get your projects in on time uh, and on budget. So you, you can articulate the business drivers very well in Nigeria and you get tremendous support. 
when we get to the other business units and start trying to put together a strategic framework, it tends to be a lot more reputation type driven than it is um, immediate operations driven. And that's a much harder sell for broad-based social investment. <coughs> Just doing regular stuff is all there, but trying to get to this level of strategic thinking is, is uh, you know, we're just starting to do that. We've got a lot of uh, uh, experts in the room that I want to take advantage of, so I want to call on a couple people. I want to just, I'm going to take ad take advantage of being the chair and, and call on a couple people. I want to first start calling on a couple folks from within CSIS. I'm hoping Jen Cook might just make a comment about Nigeria, and I'll put, you can you can thank me for that later, depending on the spot. <laughs> Um, thanks. Thank you so much for this. I mean, it is really an incredible investment, the depth of analysis and so forth. I mean, what's sad is that the government has not done this kind of analysis, and, and that's kind of where my question is on this. I mean, it seems the primary conflict driver in, in the Delta is the failure of the government. To, I mean, it, it's, it's, those states are pretty much awash in, in money, um, but, but not using that money to the betterment of citizens. So in, in this question, I wanted to ask a little bit kind of what is your engagement with the government? You talked about government uh, participation and alignment. I mean, I, I assume it varies from state to state across uh, the Niger Delta. Um, but how, uh, how, uh, how do these projects, I mean, it's hard for private companies to do this, which is perhaps the difference with AID, but how do you build in perhaps the incentives and, uh, for, to, to galvanize greater government responsibility in these? It's, that's the story of the larger delta, that things that the government should be doing have fallen by default to, to the oil companies and, and development um, organizations. So I wonder if you might say a little bit on how, how collaborative it is with the government and, and what that relationship is. Well, it, I mean, it, it's a challenge. There's, there's no doubt about it. And we're, we're doing a lot of engagement with different uh, government organizations at the uh, uh, at this point primarily at the federal and state level because uh, um, until we finalize where these poles of growth that we're focused on it's it's hard to you know start approaching local governments and that will tend to be on a project by project basis unless we have uh, local government areas which are, are going to encompass a number of different projects in our, our portfolio um, probably the most amount of engagement that we've had so far in the project has been at the federal level, primarily through the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs and the Niger Delta Development Commission. And it's kind of an interesting thing because officially speaking, the Niger Delta Development Commission comes under the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs, but it operates pretty much as if it isn't, <laughs> and which the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs doesn't really like, and it's part of the reason why they're working so collaboratively with UNDP on this uh, multi-donor trust fund or social action fund, because they see that as an opportunity to kind of make up for all the problems that a lot of people see with the Niger Delta Development Commission. But we are also working with, with them as well, with the NDDC. Um, but it's early stage. We have a pilot project, a local capacity building project which is focused on local level government um, but uh, um, is using a fund of uh, the project funds are coming from the NDDC and the uh, um, uh, the capacity building of the of the local government is being funded by NDPI and it's kind of an initial pilot and if that works out well and particularly if we feel like we're, we're having not only some impact in those local government areas but that we're also having some influence in the NDDC to take more participatory approaches in the projects that they do, then that will, will be a benefit. But we have to do a lot of multiple engagement. At the state level, we started that process, but the whole the elections basically put a lot of stuff on hold. You couldn't get anyone to do anything for the first few months of this year. And even now, it's starting to ease up. But you know, a lot of state governors are still you know selecting their cabinets and getting approvals for uh, a lot of positions. Still a lot of commissions to a point, they're getting a feel for what they're doing. So it's a slow evolutionary process, but we do recognize that if we're looking at multi-stakeholder partnerships, the government is one of those stakeholders. And you know, you, even where you have problems and challenges, you still have to work with them. You still have to address them. You can't just pretend like they're not there. 
And so we're doing a lot of engagement now. It's a little bit easier because it's more strategic and, and it's based at looking more at needs. And yeah, you know, every time that we go to a government agency and have a meeting, within a few days we get the wish list, you know, that gets sent to us. But, you know, you get past that and, and you have a, a lot of dialogue and keep that working. So, so far we haven't had a lot of interference and a lot of really blatant attempts to try and steer our money towards something which is totally useless. This. Um, but we, it's that multiple engagement which, which really helps because within even, say, the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs, we don't focus on just one person. We try to work with as many people in, you know, that have responsibilities in different sectors so that we're, you know, we don't have all our eggs in one basket in terms of how we're getting interfacing with that department. Yeah. I'm not going to get the numbers out completely right, but the, the Niger Delta Development Commission is primarily funded by the oil companies. And I think the budget, like four or five years ago, was what it was coming from there was like four or five hundred million dollars. I mean, I remember our share was like 35, 40 million dollars. We had to pay to the Niger Delta Development Commission. He was driving our management crazy because he just literally wrote this check and he had no control over what they did. So one small little mini pilot that we had going was with our eight regional development councils. We set them up where the governance committee had um, community leaders, we had some Chevron people on, but we actually asked the governors to appoint some local um, uh, government officials to these committees. And the first series of meetings that we had with them, they never showed up, they wouldn't come. And we ended up going through this, if you remember this, this horrible sort of situation that they told us they wouldn't come to these meetings as we paid them their daily sitting allowances. So we went through this whole sort of thought process about are we going to pay government officials to come to sit on committees that realistically should be there that were replacing the work that they should be doing. We, we sort of worked through that and decided that we should and we did and they started coming to the meetings. And what sort of happened was nice when they when they realized how the communities were were upset about the fact the Niger Delta Commission Delta wasn't doing anything in their areas of, 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 of interest because they were just building these roads to nowhere. They'd build these thundering great roads across the Niger Delta that had absolutely no rhyme or reason. Um, they themselves would start going to the Niger Delta Development Commission and lobbied on behalf of the community. So one very small sort of success was, I think, in getting some of them involved in our community participative committees and having them go back and lobby the government rather than us. But um, it was really small. It's really a hard, hard one. Jim Emery from IFC, I want to call on you. It's, uh, you, you lived in, you're, you cover, you're the strategic planning person for, uh, for IFC for Africa. I suspect you have a view on this, Jim. Um, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, it, to continue your metaphor, I suppose that uh, Chevron and IFC actually had an affair <laughs> that um, ended in separation. <laughs> that was our microfinance bank in, in Angola. Um, but I, I think a lot of the, the elements that you talked about have also shaped the evolution of IFC's approach to how we do uh, private sector development um, in terms of the importance of participatory processes in, in, des in designing what you do and also communicating what you do and bringing in stakeholders. Even though it may take longer initially, it, it works better in the long run, certainly. And also on the benefits of uh, trying to do things that are programmatic on a, on a sector or market-wide basis as opposed to individual company interventions, which was IFC's sort of historic background and historic tools, but I think we've also shifted much more to that ground as well. Um, so perhaps there's opportunities for a future uh, an engagement. <laughs> Although marriage, it wasn't. <laughs> no. because that's the best project I think we ever did that bank in Angola. Yeah. And I'm not sure you, it would be hard to actually sell that through the system right now, but it was back then to me it was the best, one of the best. Because we, we made an equity investment in a development project. We'd never done that before. I think that was a fabulous project. Yeah. yeah and I, what, the question I wanted to ask actually was um, in terms of how you measure success and results. 
uh, is it enough to just be able to point to the, the economic benefits, the increase in incomes among beneficiaries and stakeholders? Are you also trying to measure directly uh, the impact on Chevron's brand, uh, how Chevron's perceived by the population at large or by stakeholder groups? Are you looking for fewer attacks on Chevron facilities? Is, is it that direct? I mean, how, how do you, uh, or is it just enough to generate the economic benefits? How is it perceived within sort of your uh, overall management team you're working for? I think a bit of everything. Um, on individual projects in sort of non-conflict oriented countries, we have very good M and E systems. I think we sort of state of the art just measurement of basic statistics about the beneficiaries and the results of our projects. We do a good job on that. I think on portfolio measurement, you know, the, the, the sort of trying to understand the results from an overall portfolio of projects, we're less, you know, we're less advanced. We, we have a hard time, I think, coming up with, with metrics that would measure the impact of our social investment program in a particular country. We're, we're starting to talk about that, but I don't think we've got that good thinking. In terms of the Nigeria, I think it's probably, um, it was, it's quite easy to measure the conflict type of things, the number of attacks against our facilities versus the number of kidnappings. We actually dabbled around in that for a little bit. I, mean, I think we persuaded ourselves that we are, some of our programs in the Niger Delta were causing us less, to have less, you know, community conflict than, than Shell and Total and, you know, and, and, and uh, ExxonMobil. But uh, we do a lot of reputation research. Um, we do that sort of every two, three years in every country where we operate, where we go in and have a very sort of rigid process for talking to stakeholders, very confidential, um, some that would know us, some that don't know us. And we, we track our reputation over time in particular countries, and we have reputation management indexes. So it's a bit of everything. I think we do well in the projects. We, um, we're not so good about measuring the overall return on our social investment in sort of a you know, return on equity type of approach. We're, we're looking at some of that, but I don't, so far it seems very complicated. It's very hard to do it. Do you see any correlation there with, a, with strong uh, sort of economic results and the reputational stuff? Or is it, can you not make that connection? Um, Sylvia, do you want to comment a bit on that? I, I'm sorry. Are, the, 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 the correlation question. between our reputation and our economic return in a particular country. I, I, I just don't think we're, quite frankly, I don't think we're, we're, that's a primary or even secondary tertiary motivator here. Yeah. Uh, on, you know, obviously, it's a, it's a good story to tell, but, but um, at the end of the day, our success is, is built on what Simon and, and Dennis have been describing, but also in making a tangible what the benefit tangible actions from some of the intangibles. In other words, um, there is an opportunity, and, and CS, our partnership with CSIS is bringing all of you here together, um, that we are trying to develop in connecting <coughs> not only what is happening on the ground in the Niger Delta between all the different you know, community players, but also with governments and the U.S. government agencies to really understand what are the successful models to making you know, measurable really impacts and outcomes and where the, the partnership at this macro level will actually be, make a, 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 an equal impact. So I think there, there's that's what we really want to drive in, in these kind of forms is bring thought leaders such as yourselves within your, your organizations to see well where 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 does your piece of the puzzle fit into that for the more macro yeah. I think we're trying to brand. I mean we, we have a lot of internal discussions about branding our social investment. You know, what do we stand for? Is it is it health, is it education, is it economic development, you know, what's the main bucket where we should be putting our 
social investment sort of dollars into. And I think more of us are starting to think our brand really is around partnership. I mean, if we actually go out and look at a common theme across everything that we've been doing in this whole area, I think where we've developed partnerships, our reputation has improved. And so when we look at the reputation research over a period of time, you know, one of the main questions we always ask is if you had, and these are two neutral sort of situations, is if you had to partner with a particular company to do, um, you know, either development program or, or just a, a basic uh, business concession arrangement, um, you know, who is your partner of choice? And I, we do see ourselves creeping up the, the, the scale on our reputation research in terms of, of partnership. And I think we're starting to see some examples, again, without being naive, where it's helping us with new market entry. Uh, and if you look at across sort of the whole asset life cycle inside the company, you have a getting into new market, then you have sort of starting up a major capital project, then you go into a base business operation, then you go into decommissioning. And you can sort of look at social risk across all four of those areas. And the one thing we're finding at the beginning of the chain, at the end of the chain, a lot of this is helping us do a much better job in the way we are involved with different countries. So we're getting market entry positions, I think, from our social investment partnership um, reputation. And then we, as we get to decommission and pull out of countries, I think we are doing it in a much better way than we did before. I, yeah. Dennis, do you want to comment on this? Well, I, as most of my colleagues know, I tend to get focus specifically on the project once I, I get going. But uh, you know, a lot of these issues of looking at you know measuring success at a portfolio level rather than a project level is an issue that we deal with, and on the overall monitoring and evaluation of, of the NDPI foundation itself. And, and we've identified some fairly broad indicators that we want to make sure are measured in, in every single project. But at such early days, I, you know, I expect that uh, what we focus on in terms of indicators is really going to evolve over time. I, I've already gone through about two or three different kind of M&E plans where I'm changing indicators here and there as we get more data. So it's very much kind of a, a, a living plan, but it is critical to have that portfolio-wide, you know, uh, M&E so that we make sure that not just our individual projects are, are having an impact, but they're contributing towards a broader impact as well. Yeah, I'm going to call on Jerry, and then I'm going to call Richard Downey as well. So, Jerry, just if you could just click the microphone on. Yeah, I, I'm coming, uh, first of all, thank you very much. This was fascinating. Um, I, I'm coming at this from the perspective of someone who's been in the government trying to do something like this systematically that's government driven and I think there are a number of refugees around the table who have struggled with this for years um, and I'm fascinated by the fact that this is truly private sector led. I mean this is what you've described really turns the model, the development model on its head and um, has the company as the fulcrum for the coordination of the donors. I mean, the, the chart you had earlier had donors at the very bottom of the list. You know, you, you figured out what you wanted to do, you chose the sectors, the geography, the impact that you wanted to have, and then and you had the resources dedicated, and then you went shopping for the donors and brought the men around you. So my question is, when, you're, when we're thinking about how do you replicate this, um, what are the lessons from the perspective of uh, a U.S. government agency, for example, that would love to do this? Um, is there a, a systematic process or, um, you know, what are the tools that you would need in order to do this in, in uh, probably more of a truly partnership uh, relationship with the government? Or is the lesson that in order to get truly sustainable partnerships, they, they really are private sector led? That it, it really should start from the company perspective. And I think, Dan, you made the point the other day that you, you can't push the, the companies to a partnership. They have to be. You, you, they have to be interested. They have to be in on the ground floor. This has to be something that they truly want. Let me just let's just bunch a couple of questions together, uh, Richard, and maybe perhaps Joanne, if you want to, if you want to make a comment as well. Hi. Yeah, that, just a question really about um, has there been any sort of interaction, integration with the government's uh, amnesty program in the Niger Delta, and uh, if not, do you think there are any opportunities to sort of help breathe? 
uh, new energy into that uh, provision of jobs and, and training and so forth for those uh, militants who signed up. Julian? I just had, wanted to ask, Dennis, if you could elaborate on a few of the different um, project, specific projects you're doing and what you're looking at, and then maybe say a couple words about um, how you're integrating the local sourcing piece. You know, to Simon's point, that that's been a really productive piece of what you've done as a company. Are you guys working on that within the NPI as well? Okay, so, so just some, some uh, the lessons learned for the USG, amnesty, and local sourcing. Maybe you guys could, could split that up or take pieces of that. Well, I can start off with the government, and then you'll need to help me remember the <laughs> next question. Yeah, right. I was already focusing my answer on, on that one. But um, I think in terms of, of partnering with the government, there's a, there's a few important lessons learned, certainly for me, in this. Because, uh, you know, we, we got into this uh, NDPI after you know a lot of consultation with the uh, with the donor agencies where we weren't really finding a, a strong commitment to coming in with funding into the niger delta region for the reasons i i mentioned earlier and so we, we really felt we for one thing we we were reluctant to be too prescriptive in our strategic plan as to what we were going to do because it we wanted to you know raise matching funding from from the donor uh, the the donor partners and and if they're reluctant to fund, we figured that the partnership opportunities were going to be fairly limited. And so we needed to be fairly broad. And so when we got a stronger than anticipated reaction from potential donor partners, and you know, it was a nice problem to have in terms of having additional money, it fairly quickly got us to realize that we had to be a lot more specific and quickly about what we wanted to do because we, we had choices and we didn't have to just kind of jump on whatever, you know, strategies or schemes that the donor partners were doing, but we could be a little bit, you know, picky about who we partnered with and even in terms of our negotiations with our partners as to what we were going to focus on and what kind of programs we were going to have, what kind of a geographic scope that we were uh, going to focus on. So I think a lesson to me is, you know, don't be afraid to be too prescriptive. It's better to be more detailed as to what you want to do and then back off of that if you're not finding the donor partners available uh, than it is to, to go in with a, a, a somewhat more vague notion as to what you're going to want to do and letting your donor partners kind of push you in specific directions that don't necessarily fit the strategic objectives that we're trying to in, um, uh, trying to address. Um, I think a, a, another thing that, that uh, an important thing for the lesson, uh, lessons for the government is the, the same lesson for us. You know, uh, um, to me, the governance structure of NDPI is, is uh, um, it, 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 to me, it's already a best practice. I had an opportunity to have independent directors um, on the board of a foundation that was running in Papua New Guinea. It was a very positive experience for me. Um, and so far, it is with, with NDPI. I, I appreciate the value that the, the experienced professionals bring into that board with an independent perspective that, that really isn't driven by corporate objectives, it's driven by the development objectives. And that's a majority of the decision makers on our board. I find that incredibly healthy. And I think the U.S. government might find that healthy as well. Because we're not seeing that same kind of approach with our donor partners. And so much of it is driven by a lot of decision makers that aren't willing to kind of share that control. And that hasn't been the nature of most oil companies, most companies in the extractive sectors. Uh, um, so a bit of a side, but I think an important lesson for all of you. When, when I was working on this foundation in, in Papua New Guinea, I was uh, presenting at a conference one time where I was talking about how we had taken a company department and turned it into a foundation. And two booths down from me, there was a guy from Encanta Oil Company who was giving a presentation on how they had taken a foundation and turned it into a company department. And so we, we decided to talk and compare and find out why we were going in opposite directions. And what he told me was they, they started off with, with a good intent. And he was an NGO professional. It was this is kind of his introduction to working with extractives at all. The board of directors of the foundation that they created, this was in Peru, if I remember correctly, um, 
had actually uh, um, was all company employees. The spouse of the managing director was the chairman of the foundation, and everyone just saw it as an extension of the company. They didn't see it as they didn't see any any independent decision making, and you know. So whether it's a foundation or it's a company department, it was the company. It just represented purely the company. The thing that I like about the NDPI Foundation is that the way we structured the foundation is meant to achieve the, the, the partnership approaches that, that we have, that we, we have independent drivers. We, we are not just purely an extension of Chevron, but we, the, the, the foundation itself embraces that concept of, of partnership. And as we, as we hire people, as we get into, you know, we have some strategic partnerships that are not dedicated to a specific program, but are just guiding us through how to determine what, what to do. And so it's that kind of approach that I think makes a, a, a huge difference. If you're not prepared to sacrifice some control to the partners that you work with, it's not a real partnership. It's just basically a contractor type relationship. And the contractor will only do what you tell them to do. And if, particularly if you don't give them any opportunity to try and explore ways of improving the, the project. So to me, that's a very clear lesson learned. Just, just the other two questions, I, uh, if I, if, well, we've got a couple more questions out here. So the, just uh, shorter answers on this, these two would be on the amnesty opportunity. Is there ways in which you can link up with amnesty, the amnesty? And then can you talk about one or two examples on local sourcing? And it, it, we'll, I think we'll have enough time to get a couple more questions in. Okay. Um, well, on the, the amnesty, um, we we are actually engaged quite heavily with the um, Presidential Amnesty Committee, and. Um, it's a program that the whole oil industry is funding, uh, which we liaise closely with. So it's not the NDPI funds that we're using uh, to do some uh, nonviolence training and community outreach and, and also some skills training for the militants, but there's what's called the OGI Foundation, the Oil and Gas Industry Foundation, which we provide some input on. They have their meetings in, in the PIN Foundation mm -hmm. office, and we engage with the Presidential Amnesty Committee uh, pretty frequently. But their, their objectives are highly political, and uh, uh, their activities, are, they're, they're focused very heavily on training without enough analysis on the job market. So as we're looking at uh, analyzing employment opportunities, mm -hmm. we share that information. But I don't really see us co-funding programs specifically with the Amnesty Committee because of the risks there. But local sourcing. Local sourcing. Um, well, I think uh, Simon had touched on it earlier. We found that the value chain analysis approach that we're using for our non-oil related economic growth programs is also a very suitable uh, uh, approach to looking at uh, local community content initiatives within the company as well. And so again, we're not using NDPI funds for that activity because we're, we're kind of, there's a lot of local content initiatives going on from the IOCs in, in the region. and we can't really add much more to that other than sharing best practice with them. And so that's what we're doing. With, with uh, uh, Chevron Nigeria, local content people, we're, we're sharing the value chain analysis approach. We invited them to participate in the training that we were doing with our local partners. As we gather data, we're giving it to them, and we're also helping them to select the local partners based on organizations we've already trained. We, the, the local, you've got national content and local content, and they're slightly different. The, National content is uh, extraordinarily complex. You know, how do you build platforms and flow stations in Nigeria? And the local community content um, is, is how do you support, you know, goods and services and, and building supplies and vocational training and skills training and stuff for inside your operations. We did a good job in linking our regional development councils to our local content requirements. So as we were putting money into economic development inside these councils, we, 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 we avoided the mistake of doing training and business development services and microcredit programs and then not having the jobs because we were able to link that into our local community content requirements. The, the, the challenge at the moment is that in the last three to four years, our projects in, our, in Nigeria have been growing and our capital investment's been very strong. And so building sort of local community content, local economic growth is relatively easy in a growing capital, you know, expanding environment. 
but now we're starting to slow down and some of our projects are coming to completion and I think the challenges of maintaining that local content um, uh, and meeting the drivers is, is getting much more difficult now as we start to lay people off the projects. And one major social risk we do have is as the embassy program starts to bring people back to the Niger Delta and some of our major projects start to slow down, you've got this, um, you know, double whammy of social risk that, that we're having to start to think about. And um, it gets back to a little bit of some of the other conversations we've had, that industry cooperation in this whole area of really complex social risk is, is one of the opportunities to try uh, and help alleviate the problems that one company may have, you know, that another company can solve. But it's really hard. Dennis is on the forefront of this, but it's really hard to get industry cooperation in this whole area of social investment because you still have companies that brand it as a competitive advantage. And I think you've got to move away from that model very quickly to try and really help in, in an area as complex as it. Let me, let me bunch together three. So first, Michael Levitt, then the woman at the back, and then the woman here at the, the head of the table. So Michael. Uh, thank you very much. A, a couple of things, if I may. Um, I, I'm sort of reminded of that old movie, The Mouse That Roared. Remember, you had to make up a war and then you could get aid. It sounds like we have to make up wars in Indonesia and Angola and other places, and then the board, the corporate board, will support this kind of initiative. Short of great danger, it doesn't seem like there's enough value to the corporation in it. A little troubling. Second, I am wary of corporations setting development agendas. I happen to agree with this one, so I think it's terrific. But it doesn't mean it's going to turn out in the right way. And then the third thing is the initials I didn't hear were the oil, the national oil companies. They're the it's the growing power everywhere. I've watched Senegal back everybody down in Angola on good things, um, including my own. And um, I have, they weren't mentioned at all in this play, and they play a not insignificant role in the world of, of the IOCs. So let's move them back there. Yes, hi. I just finished being the United States Ambassador in Nigeria, uh, Robin Sanders, and I actually really find this model um, uh, very, very interesting and really like the things that I've seen here. One of the questions that I had on the table, though, in terms of inter-engagement with the state governments and whether or not you're looking at capacity building for some of the state governments, particularly the Niger Delta, um, I would say that, uh, you know, the oversight of the derivation money, uh, you know, how they do procurement, the things that could possibly take out one of those blocks that you mentioned in the poverty barrier there. You know, if you help their capacity as, as well as help the, um, the communities, uh, hopefully over the long term that they can also then step in and better do their job. So I don't know whether the foundation is looking at capacity building projects or activities or initiatives with specific state governments. And just as a quick aside, um, I raised that because we did one while I was there and it turned out to be quite well. Uh, really helping them better manage the budget, the money they get from the oil derivation so that they could use it better for projects uh, as well as infrastructure development related to communities. And it's just something I thought maybe the foundation might want to look at um, as a way to take one of those other blocks that you mentioned in your very useful PowerPoint out of that poverty bar barrier wall and out of the economic development wall. Because in the end, you've got to build the capacity not only for the communities, but at the state level as well. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to make a comment as a board member. Um, I've heard lots of presentations on this. This is by far the best and most comprehensive and complete, and I really congratulate you both on it. Um, to me, the most impressive feature of this approach uh, is the systematic thinking and analysis that goes into it before money is actually invested in on the ground projects. It will also enable us to measure the impact a lot better because we've thought ahead about 
what the standards are. So I think it's really, you've made a lot of progress. I have one question I would like to ask you, though, and that is linking it again to recent political events. Um, one of the things I'm sure you have to do is manage expectations, as um, especially when you start getting some of these projects off the ground. And uh, now that you have a president uh, elected in his own mandate uh, from this region, uh, it would seem to me that expectations are going to soar, not only in terms of what the government can do, but what corporations are going to be doing, and you sort of leading the spearhead of that kind of development. Uh, have you noticed since the election that there has been a rise in expectations, uh, more demand for quicker action, anything like that. And the second thing is the rise in the violent incidents from Boko Haram. Uh, whenever that happens in the north, a lot of southerners go back to their region. So the social risk that you will be dealing with will not only be the amnesty people who come back to the region wanting to do something, but refugees from the north, if you will, displaced persons from the north as a result of the violence, who will expect some opportunities when they come back. Have you noticed anything recently uh, with that with regard to the election? Just, just while I'm just, just not cognizant of the time, I just wanted to also put my friend Christy Reagan on the spot and just ask you thought you can thank me for that later Christy but but it would just I know that you all have done a significant amount of analysis f around or that that I think has informed a lot of the thinking for NDPI it would just be useful if you would just if you'd be willing to just make a comment about about that if you would I'd love a yeah yeah and yes um, yes We have been uh, working with Shavin on this, and I have to say that um, you know, when I squint up there, I can blur the red, white, and blue thing to think about USA, but actually, we don't have a lot of um, donor projects that are um, as rigorous and are starting out. Like, we have some, they're very large, but we don't get this kind of buy-in. I think this process that we're doing with Chevron, um, to go back to Jerry Jensen's comment, it's, it is private sector led development in a very thoughtful and rigorous way. And I have a couple of colleagues here from um, DI also that work on the chains. I have to just squeeze this in because we're coming from, um, all of us are coming from USA and we're sitting at the Holiday Inn in the Infant Plaza. And we just sat through a day and a half of um, comments about, you know, the MOUs and the 20th version of them and comments on is this cost share or is this leverage or endless discussions about them. And it is, we're not getting to discussions of rigorous value chain, uh, market led analysis that informs partnerships. It's not there. Um, I, we haven't seen it yet. And so I just want to say that this level of analysis, the kind of time and commitment that it takes from the entity to um, have patience to do this and wait. And, and I constantly heard them say, we're not quite ready yet. We're not ready yet. You really find this kind of patience, commitment to do the upfront analysis, and then um, we're going to take this back and, and go back to 50 years old people that have seen like a long time and I'm talking about this as well. Um, so I just, I think it's a best practice. I think it's a great example, and um, I'm up on shopping, and I'm just wanting to think about how we can use this as a model for other private sector actors. Thanks, Christy. Okay, so there are some questions here about uh, expectations. There are questions about uh, uh, national, the national oil companies. Uh, Go ahead, Dennis. Okay, yeah, this time I wrote them all down. Um, Good. So um, starting from the first one and going back from there, um, uh, you know, outside of conflict areas, uh, um, you know, why not do this outside of Nigeria um, or Indonesia, places like that? Um, I think that um, 
you know, what, what I've noticed within the industry is that, you know, it's very difficult to get people to want to, you know, make any sig significant systemic changes to the way they handle anything. And corporate philanthropy, corporate social investment, all of that is, is the same. If, if, if they're not seeing a strong imperative to do it, and those locations where there's significant social risks to the operations, the, the companies uh, are searching for solutions to their problems. And it's there where you see innovation. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't see as much innovation happening in the rest of the company. But the reality is that what we're doing in Nigeria, what we've done in Angola, and Papua New Guinea, all these places, is spreading out within the company. I mean, depending on who you talk to, maybe not necessarily at the pace that some people would like to see it, but it is happening. And if it wasn't for these places where we're keen to really kind of push the envelope, to think out of the box, try something new or different, just like Simon was talking about investing in a microfinance bank, you know, company would have never considered that before. And even having the structure to do that, you know, it, the great thing about NDPI is it's not only kind of a good idea to innovate in it, it's actually a mandate. We're expected to do things differently. They don't want to see the same old thing. And by doing that, in Nigeria, where people are willing to take the chances to try something different, it spreads. It takes a while to spread, but it does spread, and it spreads to those locations where it may not be such a strong business imperative to do it that way, but they still see that it's it's good business practice. You know, how will it work out? You know, that's something that we encourage everyone. When I go to, you know, any kind of a stakeholder forum or anything, my message is always the same: watch this space. You know, we uh, we're, we're very we're sharing all of our quarterly reports. We're putting out our strategic plan, our annual reports. It's all on our website. We've shared information on this initiative to a level that we never have on anything before. And we invite comment and, and feedback. And whether it will work will partly depend on the feedback that we get and the guidance and input that we get from a growing range of, of stakeholders. True, we didn't mention NMPC. They don't figure in a big way in this. But I will you know, comment that uh, we had a lot of challenges in terms of a location that we had planned for our economic development center, which was held by Chevron Nigeria, Chevron Nigeria, the title. But it was a joint venture asset. And some of the people within NMPC were kind of pushing back on donating that land to this, this initiative. But when it was taken up to the managing director of NMPC, he quashed all opposition within the, the, the company. So they, they are supportive, but again, that, that engagement is difficult. You have to take it at multiple levels to get any real, real change. Um, capacity building uh, for the state government in, in the Niger Delta, um, completely agree. We, we don't really see us doing much capacity building at the federal level. But the, you know, in our strategic framework, state and local, um, and you know, particularly given some things that you started when when you were there, we're following up on uh, uh, one of the big influencers in terms of uh, what we want to try and do in terms of uh, uh, democracy and governance is Minnie Wright, and, and she's been our our key champion um, in terms of taking a partnership approach to these these projects, which has made that relationship and that strategic planning with USAID much, much easier because we're, we're very well aligned with her thinking in terms of how to do that. Lately, our approach has not been so much to focus on specific, uh, you know, just capacity building within one state government at the government level, but as a part of our local government's efforts. So, uh, this is starting with this LEAD program that USAID has already been doing in Bauchi and Sokoto. Uh, but it's, uh, um, uh, it's, you know, you can't look at local government without looking at state government. You have to, to work with, with them together. And that's the approach that we're, we're starting on with, with Delta State. We've been exploring things with, with BIASA. But what has been a big challenge is the elections. You know, it's kind of put everything on hold with a lot of states. Some states we were able to move forward, and ones like Bielsa were still kind of in limbo because the elections aren't going to happen until next year. Um, let's see, in terms of 
the political expectations since the elections. Um, it's, it's still evolving, you know, even though the elections are a few months behind us now, um, uh, there's, you know, the, the cabinet still, the, the appointments in the cabinet just got, got uh, most of them uh, got finalized within the last few weeks. They're getting settled in. They're still dealing with a lot of the internal issues before they can focus too much on us. I've had a lot of engagement with the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs, and one of the things that has really helped with that is our first engagement was to bring them into the economic analysis workshops that we were having and looking at, at opportunities. And that really opened their eyes to see the process that we were following. It was nothing like anything that they had seen before. And so it, it really paid off for us later. We, we wanted them to be there as stakeholder representatives. And they contributed some ideas, but not really that much. Uh, but then, as we kind of expected, a few weeks after that engagement, we got the wish list. You know, and the list of projects that they wanted us to fund. But because we had involved them in the analysis workshops, it was a lot easier to explain to them to say that, look, we need to base these projects and these ideas on the analysis, not just, just start to pursue a wish list. And they could see it because they had seen the analysis and they had participated in that. And they were, they were comfortable with that. The fact was that because a lot of times when we get wish lists from the government, they're very vague. And so there's often some overlaps that you can explore. And it's like we do with any donor partner. We start off with, what do we want to do in general, and then start to narrow it down to the specifics and identify, OK, how can we take what you want to do and what we want to do and put it into a viable, integrated program that, that makes sense. And so that approach is working with the, at the federal level. Um, the challenge is at the state level, because there's nine state governments, and we've, we've liaised with some. But part of what we're looking for now, which will be a key factor in terms of which states that we uh, uh, focus on, is looking at a lot of the same governors have returned, but looking at the reform-minded ones. There's a few reformers that have, have come in now in the elections, and, and we're watching them closely to see whether they're, they're kind of follow through on what they were, were campaigning on. We should, we should probably end it there. I want to thank uh, Dennis and Simon for, for doing this. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your schedules to be with us. Uh, join me in thanking our, our visitors.